Good evening uh, here for us in Singapore and uh, wherever you are listening to this and to uh, all those who are joining us, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here for this Feast Story Swap. And we particularly, uh, all of us uh, in Feast, want to say a big thank you for joining us because for the first time uh, we are actually charging uh, for this swap. And we really appreciate your $5 donation, which will go towards the second uh, annual Storytellers Conference, which is being held in Bangalore in November this year on the 22nd and 23rd. And so um, this is just one way that we can help to try and bring in a little extra funds. And hopefully, always, our objective is to try and keep the cost as low as we can, so as not to provide a, a financial barrier, as it were, that would stop people from joining us uh, at the conference, because it really is important to us at FEAT. So thank you uh, very much uh, for all of everybody who has registered for this uh, story swap. And we're excited because we have um, quite a, a, a range and variety of storytellers here, some who are going to be telling for the first time uh, on the feast, at least in the feast um, network, as it were. So uh, our theme for today is very much the idea of planting seeds and stories of uh, hope and uh, <coughs> encouragement. Uh, so if I can uh, invite Pretty, are you there? Yes, yes, yes you I are. Am. Already, <laughs> absolutely already, and I oh well, I love the uh, pictures you've got behind you. I'll tell you the story behind them after this, after the story. <laughs> okay, I want to say just a, a little bit about yourself first. Introduce because uh, we know you because you are here in Singapore. But those who don't know you, say something about yourself. Okay, so my name is Preeti, and um, I've been telling stories literally all my life. But in my professional career as a corporate trainer and uh, leadership uh, workshop facilitator, I've used stories constantly uh, because they are my favorite tools in, uh, because they, they're, the, they, they're the ones that make the maximum impact that everybody takes home with them. And even years later, I have people coming and asking me, oh, do you remember that story you told us? I still use oh. it. And that to me is, is, is amazing. I absolutely love that. Uh, so this time when I met uh, Roger, Sheila, and the wonderful Sui Ann, uh, Anna, Louisa, and, oh, and the wonderful, wonderful group in uh, Singapore, I was hooked. And uh, this is what I'm doing now. Uh, with, I would say with a minor obsession. <laughs> okay. So what is the story that you have for us today? Okay. So my story, uh, let me give a little background. I was going to give it after the story, but I will. My sister is an artist and she's visiting from India right now in Singapore. Uh, she's doing a, a workshop, like a summer camp, art summer camp for all the kids in our condominium. So we're a bunch of about uh, eight or 10 children. So obviously I get to be assistant because, you know, then you need people who will pick up the water, run after the babies. So this I'm a what family does. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so at that time, we figured out a couple of children who were not, you know, who were, who were being overly perfectionist. You know, they want to make the Picasso on day one. So I was wondering how I could get them to relax. And this story was something that I have used in the workshop just literally three days ago. And it worked. The children have become more relaxed. They have become more creative and they use the reference of the story when they're talking to each other. So to me, I'm like, yay, it, it worked. It, it's, it's great. So this, is, this is the background of the story. I'm not going to tell you anymore because it'll spoil it. <laughs> okay. So let's go. Okay. So Vashti was a little girl who was sitting in our class. Our class had just gotten over. And she was staring at a blank piece of paper. Her teacher leaned over the paper and said, Aha, this is a polar bear in a snowstorm. Vashti made a very, very grumpy face. <laughs> very funny. I just can't draw. The teacher said, Hmm, just give it a go. Put a mark and let's see where that takes you. So Vashti grabbed a marker and on the paper, sorry, <laughs> this is what it's supposed to look like. 
No desk, right? Okay. So the teacher saw it and said, hmm, interesting. And pushed the paper back to Vashti. Now, sign it. Vashti thought for a moment. I can't really draw, but I can sign my name. And so with a flourish, still fairly grumpy, she signed it. Our class was over. She went home. Next week, when she came back, she was surprised. Over her teacher's desk, she saw something hanging. And that was her dot. The dot that she had jabbed at. Hmm. And it had been framed in swirly gold. Hmm. I think I can draw a better dot than that. And so... She opened her never-before-used set of watercolors and began to paint. So she painted and painted and painted a red dot, a blue dot, and the blue and yellow got mixed and she made a green dot. She was delighted. She made lots and lots of little dots. Then she began to experiment. She took bigger paper, bigger brushes and began to splash color all over. And as it went on, her dots became flamboyant, bigger, brighter, and extremely attractive. She even made a dot that wasn't really a dot. She was delighted. And uh, it's dots. And she left it and went on. The next week at the school exhibition, art exhibition, her dots had made quite a splash. Everybody was in love with them. And she had ex moved on to other things. She had moved on to dot sculptures, balls. Uh, she was having fun. And then she noticed a little boy gazing up at her. Oh, you're really a great artist. I wish I could draw like that. I bet you can, said Vashti. No, 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 no. Not me. I can't even draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti said with a blank piece of paper in her hand, show me. So the little boy's hand shook as he began to draw a little line. Vashti took the paper back from him and stared at the squiggle. Hmm, interesting. She pushed the paper back to the little boy and said, you can guess what she said. Now please sign it. The end. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. So the kids have loved it. Uh, all of these squiggles and uh, all of this is done in, in the art class. That This is what they've done for me. <laughs> so I got somebody to do my work for me. So I'm very delighted about that. Very nice, very nice. So now we know how that, uh, that Japanese artist uh, got started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, These yeah. paintings have been done by my, by my seven-year-old. And mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's why they're up there. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, is that, that story is from a book? Yes. I, 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 let me mention that. The Could, story Why don't you just is, put it in the chat? Why don't you just of course I can. Of and course then I if can. people want to follow up because I think, uh, yeah, it's a very good story and, uh, and I'm sure, yes, could be used in a wide variety of contexts. So, uh, not so much planting a seed, but planting a dot. Thank you very much indeed for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and now uh, I'm going to take us uh, halfway across the world over to uh, Spain, which I gather is not so sunny at the moment, Rebecca, or at least not so hot. It's kind of sunny, but it's not hot. Not that hot, oh, no. Really? No, no. What a shame. But you're looking very, you're yeah. looking very bright and cheerful, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of appreciate the rain when it comes and the, the clouds. <laughs> yes. Very good. Very good.
So, come, what story have you got for us today? So, I've got a story um, about frogs. And I'll just um, introduce myself. Yes, That's, please. Okay. So, so I, tell, I live in Spain and I tell stories in, in English, in French and in Spanish for, for kids, for teenagers and for adults um, with an audience of three people or 300 people. I guess I've never really counted people, but <laughs> more or less. Um, and yeah, I've done, I do storytelling in, in all sorts of settings, mm. festivals and little theatres, but also I've been, I did some in a prison in Barcelona, which was an amazing experience. And mm. I do online storytelling and theatre with Palestinian um, mm. students in Gaza. Yeah. And so I, I use storytelling a lot, um, as Roger and Sheila know, for, in the context of education and teaching English, because I'm also yes. an English teacher. Yeah. And yeah, I mean... Same as Priti, I, I just end up using stories all the time because I teach Reiki, I teach yoga, I do sound therapy mm -hmm. and there's always a story inside mm -hmm. there. And that's one of, this is one of the stories today that I use when I do sound therapy workshops, well, kind of um, voice, voice therapy. So the, the power of the word or more the power of the sound and, mm -hmm. and the energy that we put into it. Mm, okay. So, uh, yeah. Sound therapy, Sheila. I hope you're making a note of that for a future webinar. Sounds interesting. Sorry, <laughs> thinking off the top of my head. So, okay, Rebecca, yeah. that's good. Let's hear about the frogs. So, in one of those parts of India, which probably many of you know even better <laughs> than me, um, where the sun in the summer, where the sun is so brutal and the rain is scarce, there was a big group of frogs hopping through the forest. They were looking for water, a river, a pond, a puddle even, anything would have done. They hadn't seen or drunk water in, in days. And suddenly one of the frogs at the front of the group croaked, well, well, and they all looked up and there was a well. It was like a dream come true. They all started hopping towards that well and they leapt onto the little wall that surrounded the well. They looked in, it was dry, completely dry. And one of the frogs suggested maybe climbing down on the, in a wall to try to find some wet patches or humidity just to have a little lick, something. But the group agreed it was far too dangerous. The well was far too deep and any frog that would climb down would very probably fall and die. So they decided to leave the well and to continue it on their search for water. And suddenly there was a shuffle there as they were moving away and two of the frogs fell into the well, deep and deep. And all the frogs at the top, they saw their friends going down and down and down. And then both frogs managed to hang on to something on the inner wall of the well. And they tried to climb up. But there was hardly anything to grab onto, just a few stones, a little twig here and there, and they'd fall back down. And the frogs at the top, they were looking down at their two friends, and they looked at each other and they said, it's impossible. And so one of the frogs shouted down, it's impossible. And another one said, yeah, you won't manage. And another one shouted down, you can't, it, it, you're too far down. But the frogs inside, they were trying any strategy they could. They were standing on each other's heads. They were trying to climb, to leap, to, to jump, to trying everything. And the frogs at the top, they kept shouting, you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to. It's impossible. It's frogly impossible. We're telling you. And one of the frogs hearing these words just let go and fell deep, deep, deep into that well. And it hit the floor hard and it splattered and died. And the echo of its death rose to the top. And the other the frogs at the top there, they heard that and, and they looked at each other and they said, we can't bear seeing this remaining frog, our friend still trying. And they shouted down, you can't do it. Just give up. It's better to have a quick death and a slow, painful death. Give up. And as two or three of them at the same exact time, shouted down the same exact words it's impossible give up the remaining frog got this renewed energy and strength and power and pushing on its little legs it leapt to the left and to the right and bouncing off the inner walls of that well it literally flew out of the well and 
landed a few meters away. And all the frogs hopped towards it and patted it on the back and said, you survived, you survived, you're amazing. And one of them said, how did you manage to keep going and to find the energy to keep going when we were telling you it was impossible? And the frog said, I beg your pardon? And they repeated, how did you find the energy when we were telling you it was impossible? We thought it was impossible. And the frog said, oh, I'm a bit deaf, you see. I thought you were encouraging me. <laughs> wow, very nice. Very good, very good, very good. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, wonderful. I, I love the way how you uh, use the camera uh, when you're telling the story. Uh, I really saw the down into the <laughs> well with the frogs, which was really nice. And, and, and a couple of the, the phrases, I love that. Something about the, where in India where the sun was too brutal and the, what was it, and the rain is so scarce. I thought that was a great line. Uh, and another one about the echo of his death. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, it, 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 it was such a powerful line, not what I would expect in that kind of, you know, folk tale. The echo of his yeah. death. I don't know. It seems very kind of Hemingway or something. Um, oh. Beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank very you. Much. Lovely. Um, funnily enough, I'm actually going to be telling uh, a, a different story about a frog and the lack of water tomorrow and in frog and locusts. So frogs are, are very good creatures, aren't they, to have in... Um, uh, stories. Yeah, so, they're very, uh, they're, they're quite physical. <laughs> yes, yes. Good. I love the jumping. That was very the, the bouncing off the walls in a good way. So Rebecca, uh, she referred when uh, in her introduction about the work she does in terms of using storytelling uh, in her work uh, teaching uh, English as a foreign language. And if uh, you didn't catch her webinar on that very topic. Uh, you will be pleased to know that that is available for you. You just go on to the feaststory.org website and you will be able to find it there. And you can then, um, and at only $5, it's the same what it would have cost you to um, sign up for the webinar in the first place. Uh, if you're a member, uh, you'll be able to, we'll send you the link and you can download that and uh, listen to it at your uh, leisure. It was a really uh, interesting uh, I was sharing with uh, uh, Rebecca before we actually started the uh, the session uh, this evening how I'd taken one of the stories. I absolutely love the stories, and I shared it with uh, a group of students that I was working with. Uh, actually, a group of uh, intellectually challenged kids, and they also really enjoyed the story. So it's worth doing the webinar, whether you're a language teacher or not, just because of the three stories that she shared during it. Carla, are you there with us? You have a story for us. Is your story from uh, India? No, it's from Croatia. From Croatia? Oh. Yeah. Wow, a story from Croatia. Very good, very good. Uh, and how did you come across this story? How did I come? From a book? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I thought you might have been, you know, might have been there or something. No, no. Okay. We should run a quiz on, uh, yes, can anyone say, where is Croatia? Very good, very good. So, all right, so why don't you tell us, because this is your first time, I think, of actually uh, telling uh, uh, for a few swap, isn't it? That's yes. So uh, just say a little bit about yourself to uh, introduce yourself to the rest of us. Yeah, what do I tell about myself? I don't know. What do you, what, you know, what is fit for public consumption? Uh, been with the association now for 10 years, enjoy listening to stories, and whenever I get a chance, I do tell stories. Uh -huh. I do public speaking, and I've noticed usually the finalists are always the one with a compelling story during the competitions. Mm. So, the power of stories, and I do believe every life is a fascinating story. Sure, sure. Well then, why not share with us the gift of uh, your story? Okay. Long ago, two angels in heaven were arguing. One said, humans on earth are evil and mean-spirited. The other angel felt, no, they were kind and good people. Finally, they argued themselves into a bet and said, Go down and find me three good people in three days and I'll agree to what you say. The optimistic angel goes down to earth, there dresses himself as a beggar and finds his way through the village 
he hears about a family with three brothers. The parents have just died, leaving behind a small farm, a cottage, and a beautiful pear tree. The angel approaches while the first brother is standing to the tree, standing on a ladder and pruning it. He says, kind man, a pear for this poor, hungry beggar. He says, this tree not only belongs to me, but also to my brothers. But well, I'll share the pear that I would have had for lunch with you. The beggar is happy. He walks out of the village thinking, that's one good man. The next day, the beggar returns. And now the second brother is standing to the pear tree. And he says, the beggar tells him, a pear for the hungry beggar. The second brother repeats, the tree doesn't belong just to me. It also belongs to my brothers. But here I share what I would have eaten for lunch. The angel smiles and thinks to himself, oh, a second good man. He comes down the third day while the third brother is sitting under the shade of the tree and he asks for a pair. He shares his pair with the beggar. The beggar returns thinking, I must reward the three brothers. He returns the next day as a wealthy merchant. The brothers can't believe their eyes. He said, don't worry, your farm will be taken care of. The first brother, they, he leads them to the meadow. There he sees a huge meadow with a deep river. The first brother, he tells the first brother, make your best wish. He wishes the meadows were vineyards and he had a winery and his wine would be famous all over. With the staff of his wand, his wish is granted. He leaves him saying, remember, God's poor. He takes the second brother to a valley full of black birds. And he says, make your best wish. The second brother says, I wish all these words, birds were sheep and I had a mill and wool, I would be the wealthiest wool merchant. With the staff, with the staff of his staff, his wish is granted. He takes the third brother down to the forest and he says, he thinks and says, I want a woman who will love me for who I am. He says, That's a rare wish and let me see what I can do. He says, there are just three such women. Two are married. Come, let's rush to the third one. So they rush to the third. The king says, how do I know who is the best suitor? I have two princes, a king and a sultan waiting already. He says, no worry. You have five olive trees. Cut a branch with each one's name. Plant it. And the next morning, the plant that is alive will be the man your daughter should marry. And sure enough, the next day, four of the branches are dead, but the fifth one is still alive, and that is the young farmer. They marry with a huge celebration. They are taken to the edge of the forest and said, this cottage is yours. And the angel leaves saying, remember God's tour. Time passes by, it's a year, the angel comes down to check on the brothers. He first approaches the first brother and says, a drop of wine for this thirsty man. And he says, off with you. If you don't leave the place, I'll set my dogs on you. With a swish of the wand, he turns and sends him back to the pear tree and he loses his vineyard and everything. He then goes to the second brother's house, he says, a little warm shawl for the old man. It says, off with you, I'll set my guards on you. Again, with the swish of the wand, the angel takes away everything and he's sent back to the old pear tree. Off he goes to the third brother and they welcome him home and say, we have very little, but what's ours is yours. 
soon the dry loaf turns into a rich white bread the soup into a rich soup full of meat and vegetables and the water plain water that they offer apologetically turns into wine sweet wine angel is happy he turns takes his staff once more turns it into rows and rows and rows of pear tree and says thank you you remember god's poor this will all be yours and for your children and your grandchildren that's my story a good story uh i like that one very much indeed thank you so uh and i'm i'm glad to see that the uh the chat uh is really moving along as you um we tend with this to try and keep moving so that we get as many people to tell as we can but if you have a question for a teller or you want to give them some feedback then please use the chat you'll see the bottom uh the chat button at the bottom of your screen if you haven't uh, discovered that already So Sweyen uh are you there this is okay I'm going to check whether people can see this okay Yeah yes we can yeah Oh okay okay, okay. Yeah okay. All right um my story Oh first um, of all come on Sweyen you can't get away that quickly you got to tell us a little bit about who you are Okay and the exciting um, things that you're doing in Singapore at the moment <laughs> Um there are many things I'm doing but um this one exciting thing that I'm doing I mean I I've been telling stories to uh for, to children my own children and then and then the children in schools and then um recently to senior citizens mm. um recently I'm doing a program um pulling stories from them and telling stories to them and um my story today is hot off the press <laughs> because uh. I did something with them with my story box story cubes if you can see this mhm yeah so um i did this uh together with two other storytellers and um so it it's like a game for the senior citizens and uh amongst them um eight of them uh a majority have And so um it wasn't easy for them to remember things and they are rather nervous about um sharing things because they keep saying oh I don't remember I don't remember I don't know um but when we did this exercise with them today it it turned out quite well so I'm taking whatever they gave me and then turning it into a story so so I just 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 made it into a a complete story and somehow it fits into your theme of hope I didn't realize <laughs> So I shall tell my story. Um once upon a time there were two Chinese brothers. Their parents died leaving them a piece of land and a rooster. You can see the rooster in the hands of the two brothers. They were very poor, very hungry. Both brothers tilled the land and grew vegetables hoping that the crops they grow would feed them and also to sell them for money. The rooster was once a small chick and the brothers that the brothers kept and grew they fed them till it grew bigger and bigger and soon the rooster soon uh, grew and strangely and interestingly the rooster had a crest that was not just red the typical red but it had this yellow crest golden yellow almost looking like a crown now the rooster became a faithful alarm clock for all of them crowing at the break of dawn at 5 a.m. to wake everyone up but not only that because the parents of these two brothers often spoke in different chinese dialects so the rooster could crow in different language or dialects it could crow in teochew kukuri it could crow in cantonese kuku kuku well so much so for the two brothers and their rooster one day a huge fire broke out it burned the house of the two brothers it burned their crops it burned the village the the jungle around them and the thatched houses in the village the fire forced the two brothers to flee but what could they bring along nothing but the rooster 
Younger brother held tightly to the rooster as they ran away from the fire to the river. There was only one boat at the river. And so the two brothers quickly jumped into the boat. They rowed as hard as they could, but the downstream river current carried the boat fast and out of control. The boat, oh, this is the picture of the boat, but anyway. Sorry, Yen, unfortunately, yeah. your image has frozen. We're not getting any visual oh. cord, but the audio is very clear, so that's why I'm letting it run. Okay, okay. Uh, I don't know what, what's, what's wrong. Never mind, just, just carry on. We'll listen to it. Okay. We'll listen to it, okay? Oh, so you can't see me doing my actions, huh? but never no, mind. <laughs> no. But the downstream river current carried the boat fast and out of control, and the boat crashed into a huge rock and began to sink. As the water seeped into the boat, Big Brother began to complain about the hard life that led since their, brothers, uh, their parents died. All all the vegetable crops that they had grown all burned. There's nothing left except right now for that, that rooster. And so Big Brother pointed the rooster to a younger brother and said, why are you still, in, still holding on to the rooster? We're about to die. Save yourself. Let it go. Let it go. You need both your hands to swim. Swim to the river to, to safety. Uh, swim in the river to safety. So soon, the brothers, uh, the younger brother insisted on keeping the rooster in his arms. And in, in, his, uh, in one arm, with the other hand, he paddled and paddled. But the rooster was bobbing up and down in the water. Finally, the younger brother said, okay, I'll let go of my rooster. And did the rooster die? No. In fact, the crest on its head opened up even bigger. And once it was released, the rooster opened its wings and flew away. Bigger brother said, elder brother said, look, the rooster has left us. Let's save ourselves. And so both brothers swam as hard as they could to safety. And as they got out of the waters, they were tired and hungry. Then they saw their yellow, red, crested rooster flying down. And in its mouth were fruits, berries, and soft plants. And so off it went and it would come back every once in a while with soft plants and berries for the two brothers to eat. And they ate and they were filled and then they fell asleep. They woke up the next morning to the rooster crowing in the different dialects. Mm -hmm. Cuckoo, 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 and cuckoo-ree. And that reminded them of their mom and their father, their mother and father. And so the younger brother said, you see, elder brother, the rooster is our only memory of our parents. It's our family. See, it saved us. So having filled their stomachs and, you know, rested, the two began to walk down the road. They managed to stop a truck that was driving by. Um, and um, they, they got into the truck. The truck driver offered them a ride to town. Happy and safe, they dozed off inside the truck, the little brother holding, hugging the precious rooster. But who is to know, as the road was windy and muddy, the driver lost control of the vehicle and it veered left and right and it hit the tree. So, punctured the front tires. Younger brother woke up in a fright, clinging on to the rooster. It looks like trouble again, but this time, older brother was calm and he looked at the rooster with optimism and he said, you know what? There will be trouble. There will be sufferings. But as long as we have each other, we are blessed and we'll face them bravely. 
that's the story. Mm. Wow, thank you. That's not what I was expecting with that story. Very nice. I love the idea of a uh, not bilingual uh, rooster, <laughs> but the fact that, you know, with, with the different dialects, I've never heard that. Um, it would be an interesting idea to have the, you know, the idea of, uh, because uh, different languages record the sounds, don't they, differently. Um, uh, I know frogs, for example, uh, in, in Korea, it's like kagul, kagul, and uh, of course we say uh, croak, croak, but uh, there are different, uh, different languages. Yeah. How, 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 do frogs, how do frogs croak in Mandarin? Oh, you've come back uh, now. Kukwa, kukwa. Kukwa, kukwa. There we go. You see? Okay. Yeah. I actually checked out on, on um, rooster crowing. <laughs> Apparently on YouTube, there, there's somebody who went to interview uh, different cultures and how... Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Cultures. And so today's, um, the, the Teochew and the Cantonese were actually from the seniors themselves. Yeah. Oh, sure. we, were, we were having a whale. We were laughing away as, as they, you know, different dialect group and they had their own versions of the, 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 the rooster crowing. So, yeah. so I thought, oh, we'll put that into the story. Very <laughs> nice, yeah. Uh, in Italian, I think it's uh, chichirichi, chichirichi. So, great. That's very good. Yeah. So, you, you use the, the, the cue as a trigger, is it, for memories? That's the idea? Yeah, and, and because most of the cubes are small, right? Yeah. So I, I, made, I printed these out. Mm. I, I got the pictures of um, license-free pictures and then, and then there was a template online and, and then I put them in and they would, I would fold them into, I could fold yeah. them into a box. Yeah. So there was my, my um, uh, uh, and then the, each senior citizen threw like, like a dice mm. and, and then uh, whatever picture they, they would have to link from the previous picture and, and then make sentences and link and link oh, and link. Okay. So this is the, the river. Yeah. Um, this was the crash, although it's a car crash here, but then mm. uh, we changed it to, you know, the boat oh. crashed, right? Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then this crown was one of, one of the senior citizens. Uh, uh, really, she was, uh, he, was, he, was, he, he was very creative, and, and he, he saw the crown in the middle of the story, and he said, oh, the, the rooster is, is a king, actually. <laughs> so, so he gave us this idea, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, it all came from the senior citizens. So, so now we, we just polish it up a little bit better for them. <laughs> yeah. That's and hopefully they can tell it. That's great. What a, what a great way to... Um, maybe uh, we should look at you for, for running a, a webinar, please. Uh, <laughs> on, on, no, on, on, on uh, sharing some of the work that you do. Well, uh, now we're going to go right across uh, several ponds, really, in order to get to uh, uh, Hope, who's in Maine. Uh, um, Hope, are we there? I am certainly oh, I, I, here, Roger, and I'm excellent. delighted to be, to be part of this story swap. Well, that's it great. Is, it is morning here, yeah. and I will tell you, I am dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, every time I've seen you, you've always been dressed, so that doesn't surprise me, uh, Hope. Um, so, and do share with us about the, the, the Guild, because I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed being able to share the stories and hear the stories from uh, your mo mostly uh, American colleagues who are telling stories, but not exclusively. It was really nice listening to Maria from Peru, uh, who was the last, uh, on the last session. Well, thank you, Roger, and thank you, Sheila, and I'm glad, thank you for the, your efforts to put this together. I am the president of the board of directors of Northeast Storytelling in the U.S. I live in Maine, and I also coordinate a local storytelling guild near my home, but I also coordinate the worldwide virtual storytelling guild. The Storytelling Guild is totally online via Zoom, and we enjoy being able to cross all kinds of boundaries and to learn from other tellers from around the world. We have two different times because the globe, as it turns out, is enormously large. It so is. we have one time that is set so that we we can reach toward the west and enjoy Roger's company. 
and another time that we reach towards our east and enjoy the company of tellers from England, Ireland, Switzerland, Africa, whatever. Yeah. So it's an, a wonderful opportunity, and I will put the um, I will put my email address in the chat screen Great. after I finish running my mouth, so that if you're interested, I can send you the information. I did bring you a story today, however. Well, that's great. So and it, we... is, it is is my favorite story. Oh, wow. That's good. Let me tell you just a, a brief bit about this story so you have a context. This is a story that was collected by a folklorist a little over 200 years ago. Oh, probably about 15 miles from where I live now. It is a local folk tale. And some of the terms that you will hear are old terms that were used in Maine. So for example, you'll hear the term Pompeian. Pompeian is now called pumpkin. <laughs> so there are some archaic terms and I will be delighted to try to translate as I go along. I normally tell this in heavy dialect because the coastal dialect here in Maine is very strong, but I will try not to confuse you by doing that today. This story was collected by Benjamin Botkin, and it's called, Who Shall Rule the Roost? I take you back to 1800. Tom and Sarah went to housekeeping about six weeks after they were married. They moved, they moved up there on the ridge, on the ridge um, just below the poplars and the birch trees. They moved into Hiram's old place up there. It was a small one-room cabin, but they had a shed, just big enough shed so that they could keep a cow. And they had chickens. And Tom found that they had an old apple tree that had overgrown and he couldn't wait to prune it and get it to grow and give apples. In the meantime, he planted flax and he planted pompion and he planted squash and they sold eggs. They were delighted to finally be together. Soon after they moved in, however, Tom picked up a heavy link of rope, yards and yards of heavy rope. He put the coil over his arm and he called to Sarah and said, Sarah, Sarah, it is time that we decide who shall rule the roost in this marriage. Who will be the one to make the decisions? Let us decide. Come with me. Well, Sarah was up for a challenge. So she followed Tom, and Tom went out to the, the shed, and he took that long coil of rope, and he threw one end of it right up over the roof of the shed. And he said to Sarah, Sarah, now you go around the other side and you grab a hold of that rope. And when I yell, start, you try to pull me over the shed and I'll try to pull you over the shed too. And whichever one of us pulls the other one over the top of the shed, that one will be in charge in this marriage. Sarah grabbed hold of that rope and she put her foot up against the side of the shed and she leaned back. And when Tom yelled, start, she started pulling and pulling and pulling and, and she lifted Tom, Tom's feet off the ground by like this much. And then 
Tom pushed away from the wall of the shed and he landed on the ground and pulled Sarah up. Oh, they both struggled. They pulled and they pulled and they pulled. <sighs> Finally, when neither one had been able to pull the other one up over the top of the shed, Tom yelled, stop, enough, come around. Well, Sarah came around back to Tom and Tom said, now, you see this rope? I hold the one end on this side. The other end is over where you were on the other side. But now, let's try something different. I'll hold on to the rope and you hold on to the rope too. And we will both pull the rope together. They pulled together and the rope slid back over the shed and landed in a coil, came over like a buttered snake, landed on the ground in front of them. And Tom said, Sarah, let that be how our marriage shall be with both of us pulling together. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Oh, I didn't get that one. I, I thought that was going to be, you know, uh, yeah, I was expecting a completely different ending or direction for that story. <laughs> I thought, oh, it's mail bashing time again. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> waiting for somebody to be tying one end of the rope to the cow, you know, and then to trick the other partner. <laughs> Didn't see that ending coming at all. That is beautiful. That is really. Thank you. I, I, I can understand why that is, could well be your favorite story. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, uh, where, where do you tell that story? Weddings? I tell it any place I can. <laughs> For you. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, and I, I'm just curious, uh, it, it came over like a buttered snake. Um, what, 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 why would you butter a snake? Is this a, a, a New England uh, delicacy that I haven't heard of? Or, yeah. What, what, <laughs> how, how would there be a buttered snake? That was a seren that was purely a serendipitous phrase oh, that okay. came out of my mouth one of the times that I was telling the story. And yeah. I was sort of thinking of, what is slippery and yep. sliding mm, yeah. and like a rope? And I thought, rope, butter. snake, butter, slide, <laughs> easy. There you go. Okay, butter, <laughs> snake. Very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was funny, because I, I was thinking, you know, it, this was, again, the, that wonderful story of serendipity. We've just had a story about, um, from Sui Yen about the importance of a rooster. And here you are coming with, you know, who rules the roost. I mean, it's just like wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, I'm there, my head's all in, in, in the chickens, as it were. And, of course, it's a story about <laughs> marriage and love. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, now, I, I think we've uh, managed to get uh, Sri Devi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you very clearly. Yes, indeed. So, so where are you speaking to us from? All right. So I am uh, based in Mumbai, in ah. India. Mm -hmm. I'm a storyteller here. I go by the name Talking Turtles, if any of you all have heard of that. Um, so I primarily work with children. And uh, in the last about six months, I um, started working with adults, do a lot of adult storytelling, um, corporate workshops, teacher training. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. And, and, and wh where did, where did talk, Talking Turtle come from? Is this... So, <laughs> we, uh, so we started in 2010, of my friend and I, and uh, we thought we should do Talking Something. Mm -hmm. uh, Turtle ended up being uh, a favorite of both of us. So okay. we went with Talking Turtle. Very good, very good. Uh, and I gather you want to uh, share with us a story that is based on uh, one of my favorite books from India, Out of the Way. Yes, Out of the Way. So I have my own, I've tried to kind of um, edit it and bring it down to five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so it's gonna be my own version. Very but good. I, I'm, the reason I'm, I'm excited is because in the print uh, version, uh, the, um, 
the artist, the illustrator, uh, Uma Krishnaswamy, uh, is actually now working with Feast on our second book, uh, which is a collection of um, stories about royalty. And I just, I just love the illustrations in Out of the Way, Out of the Way. So, uh, and I uh, am really looking forward, because I, I told this story quite recently at the children's garden here. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, so come, let's hear you. I realize it'll be a challenge for you to get it to five minutes, so have fun. <laughs> okay, so here goes. A little boy uh, walked out of his house and was on his way to school. Now, while on his way to school, uh, he lives in a little village in Tamil Nadu. So on his way to school, he sees a little, a small plant. And um, he sits down and observes this little plant, which is a sapling, just a small shoot with a few leaves on it. And his friends come talking to him. They watch him and they're like, what are you doing? So he tells them, oh, I'm just watching this plant. And they're like, they make fun of him. And they say, let's go. You know, you're wasting your time looking at a little plant. What's wrong with you? And they rush him and he's off to school. And on for, you know, he keeps going back and forth from home to school. And as he watches this little plant uh, every day, as he's going to school and coming back from school, he keeps an eye on this plant. And um, he decides that he should probably take care of it. So before school begin, before he starts going to school, he stops by and starts watering the plant. And it's like a little pet of his. Of course, his friends keep making fun of him and they're like, you know, you're wasting your time. What are you doing? The plant will grow on its own. But he thinks it's his job to protect this plant. Over a period of time, he starts to build, pick up pebbles and builds a little, um, you know, barricade around it to protect it so people don't stamp over it. Um, you know, and again, his friends make fun of him. They're like, you know, who's going to bother with a little barricade made of pebbles? You know, you're, you're not, you're wasting your time. But he says, somebody will. So as people start walking by, they look at this little plant growing and they look at a barricade made of rocks around it. And they walk around it, right? They go around this thing. The little plant grows and grows and grows. And as it's growing, the boy and his friends are playing around this plant. And anyone who comes down this dusty path, the boy calls out and says, Vari vidi, vari vidi, which in Tamil means out of the way, out of the way. So the milkman cycling by or the dhobi cycling by or anybody walking up and down this dusty path, if they're anywhere close to this plant with the barricade of rocks around it, the boy immediately calls out and says, Vari vidi, vari vidi. Over a period of time, his friends think this is fun to do. So they also join in. Months pass, years pass, the plant has now grown into a beautiful tree. And now the boys sit down and they watch. This tree is now providing shade for them in the summer to play with. And the boy smiles. In his mind, he thinks what a good job he's done. And his friends realize what a good job he's done. People are resting under the tree. The birds are chirping on the tree and building their nest. There are fruits on the tree, which the children climb over, pluck and eat. Time passes by and the tree grows larger and bigger. There's home to more insects, birds. It's home to the children and the people. The old people in the village come and sit under it with a little mattress. They have a picnic under this large, big tree. The boy now, of course, is old. He's 18 and he's a very big boy, but he still comes and plays with his friends under the same tree. And children that have grown up after him are also playing under the same tree. And he's feeling good about this. Now, as time would have, with growth comes development. And it so happened that down this dusty path, they want, the people in the village wanted to convert this dusty path into a road. So the panchayat or the local government in the village decided that this is going to be the main road so that business and trade can grow. And this worried the little boy, of course, and he didn't want them to uproot this plant. So he and his friends sat there saying the same thing that they said since they were children. So when the contractors came and they came and saw this big tree and they wanted to uproot it, they said, very vidu, very vidu. And they made such a noise about it. And they explained to everybody what this tree was to them. 
The people of the village, the elders, also realized that the boy and his friends were right. So they said, that's right. This tree means a lot to us. Can't we do something about it? Can't we let this tree be and build the road around it? So that's what they did. They built the road around it. People went from here to there, from there to here. On that road, the tree remained. The boy was now a young man who used that road to go to the city, to work, to grow and to, uh, to have his own family. Years passed and he came back to visit his village with his little son. And when he came and stood there, he stood there under that big tree with the road going around it. And he sat down under that tree to tell his son the story of that tree. The end. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> very nice, very nice. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love the way uh, in, in your telling of the story, you really focused on the boy uh, and made that the kind of thread going through the story. And I think that's very important, um, uh, particularly you know, at the start of the story, that this is just one kid uh, who does something very simple. He just makes a, a little barricade of the stones around the tree. And in doing that very small, very simple action with just one tree, Actually, it has such a big impact, doesn't it? And I think it's really important um, that if we can share that message um, with people that we may just be one person, but, you know, we can actually make a difference and we have to Absolutely. do it one step yeah. at a time, one, one straw, one plastic bag, in this case, one tree <laughs> at a time. Um, when, I, when I told it, because it was, more, it was an outdoor setting, um, I really went to town with all the... Um, uh, the, the out of the way and got the audience um, chorusing that and had uh, lots of different uh, things coming by, not only the, um, the cyclists, but I had an, an elephant coming through and I had a procession of women going to the temple and the man carrying a whole lot of pots and pans, clang, 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 clang. Uh, and we just kind of made, had this incredible noise. I wish I knew, I, I, I never thought of asking the, the, the Tamil, Barry Bade, I've written that down. Uh, that will go into my future time <laughs> very much indeed. Yeah, that was that's, that was really good. Like that. Okay, so um, please uh, do look out for. Uh, we've seen a couple of the illustrations uh, that Uma has prepared already. Uh, the book is coming on very nicely. Uh, we've had um, uh, twenty-five, uh, I think it is, of submissions from storytellers uh, from all over the place. Uh, Asian folk tales, that is, but submitted by authors not necessarily living in uh, Asia. Um, and we will be launching a crowdfunding campaign, uh, hopefully in early July, in order to help us to raise the kind of um, six thousand uh, dollars thing that we need to get this uh, printed. So um, we will be getting in touch, and I hope that you'll um, support that because it's a really good uh, selection of stories and. What we, Kiran Shah, who is our editor, she's a Feast member. Uh, she edited last year's um, book, The Collection of Food Tales, which is also available online. You just go to the feast-story.org uh, and there in the, sh the shop or the store, uh, you can actually see that and you can get a, a, an e-copy of the book. Um, but Kiran really asked the people who were submitting the stories that they submit the story not in a literary form, but in a tellable version. So really, uh, she asked, share a story that you tell regularly and to share it in the way that you tell it. So that it is, um, for those of us who are storytellers, we hope the book will be a really useful resource that you can take. Oh, I like that story. And while, of course, you will give your own spin to it, that's important, but at least you've got a story that you know will work in a tellable version and you won't have to kind of get rid of all the literary um, guff uh, that other people might have wanted to put into it in a, a more literary version of the story. So thanks very much indeed for sharing that with us, Shidevi, that was great. And thank you for persevering and actually getting in touch. So uh, Shalni, you've been waiting very patiently there and wow, yes, your, your lighting's looking really good. I'm glad. Yes, yes. It could almost be like, you know, you're in a photo studio there. It's very oh. dramatic, very good. Thank okay. you. Yes, you're looking terrific. Thank you very much, Roger. I, I think you should also now introduce yourself. Yeah. We tend to forget that because, you know, we've worked together and we've performed together and told together. Yeah. Uh, but yes, let, let people know who you are and what you do. 
Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shalini. Um, I work a lot with children. So I, I train them in storytelling and public speaking, and I tutor English. So, um, and even with the kids I work with, I try to, with their creative, I think it was creative writing, um, I try to introduce uh, stories to them so that they kind of learn the structure. Uh, Sheila, today I was trying to get them to do the character first uh, method that, of Kendall Havens. And uh, some actually, uh, I, I just saw a light go through. I, on you know in one of my students eyes and she actually found it easier to write so um and she just wanted to write after looking at that breakdown made it much simpler so uh, that's great. Good, so good, that, good. Yeah. So, yeah that's what i do uh this is my first time telling uh on the swap and um so my and story about time too <laughs> thank you uh and my story is called the god of poverty uh, I found this in a book uh, at Sheila's uh, when I was looking for a story for the mentorship. And um, I liked it a lot because, um, I don't know, it was just, it was a simple story. It is a simple story, but very, very, uh, I don't know, it resonated in some way. So um, here it goes. It's a Japanese folktale. And um, in the book, in the story, there are no names for the young people, but I like to give my characters names. So, um, so there was a young man, uh, Hiroshi. And he was a very hardworking young man, never took a day off. Uh, he worked from before the sun was up to long after the sun was down. If it rained, he would work in the house. If it was too windy to go up to his vegetable patch, he would work around the house. But he never took a day off, not even a half a day. And he worked so hard, and yet his life was really very poor. Um, fortunately for him, uh, a matchmaker managed to find him a wife. And even more fortunate, his wife was just as hardworking as he was. And together, they planted, they sowed, they weeded, they fertilized, and they harvested whatever they could. But for some reason, whenever they planted new seeds, the crows would come down and they'd start pecking at the seed. And so they'd have to replant the seeds. And if little seedlings managed to grow, oh, little rabbits would come and nibble on them. Or worse, caterpillars would swarm around the leaves that would grow. Oh, and if by any little chance, some sweet radish or daikon or something would grow underground, the big roots, wild hogs would suddenly turn up out of nowhere and be digging it up and scatter it out. And even then, if they managed to take a little bit home, the house mice would get to them. Their life was miserable, but they never gave up. They kept working harder and harder. So one December, they were cleaning the house as always for the new year. And as they were cleaning the family altar, the wife said, you know, his wife's name, his wife was Yukie. And Yukie said, you know, Hiroshi, we did not have much this year but at least we were not ill. And so, oh, I will pray for better things for us. And as she did so, she cleaned the altar. Now this time, as they cleaned the altar, when they reached the back, they saw something small trying to skulk away. And Hiroshi quickly grabbed it and held it in his hand. It looked like a dry, shriveled up, black little mouse. And Hiroshi said, oh, who are you? And the mouse was like, I am the god of poverty. And Yukiya was like, the god of poverty? I've never heard of the god of poverty. He said, yes, well, I've been here a long time, way before you. When your father was around, young man, oh, I loved those times. Your father, what a man. He was the laziest man I'd ever met. He just sat around all day, uh, woke up late, never tended to the fields, ate, slept. And if he had any money, he gambled it away. He drank with his friends. And if anybody ever complained, kicked them. And soon everybody, all the servants left. And there was no money. 
all the fields had to be sold off. The sun has to feel the most beautiful one in that corner, another one over there. And soon, all that you were left with was that mountainside vegetable patch that you so love and a sunless rice paddy. And when your father passed away, I thought, hey, the son of a man like that is not going to take the burden for very long. In three days, he's either going to hang himself or he's going to leave, become a beggar. But then, after three days, you were still around. And then, three months later, you were still around. Not only that, you brought a wife. And your wife is such a nuisance. She's more hardworking than you. She cleaned up every cobweb in the house. She cleaned up my favorite spot, that, that, that messy storeroom. No longer. And I found myself trying to find desperate ways to do something to, to stop you. So when you planted seeds, I got the birds in. When they started to sprout, I got the rabbits. I got the caterpillars. And then by some chance we had those, the, some kind of harvest, I got the hogs. I got the mice. But what did you do? You kept working. You kept planting. Oh, and now you look at me. I'm in this state because I've had no time to take care of myself. I might as well leave. So goodbye. But Hiroshi said, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And he turned to Yukie and said, you know, he has been here since my father's time. He's like a father to me. We have no one to take care of. Let's take care of him. And Yukie said, yes, yes, absolutely. Even the god of illness and the god of anger, they get offerings too. We shall adopt the god of poverty. And so they turned to the god of poverty and said, please stay with us and we will take care of you like an old father. And so they put him back on the altar. And from that day on, they kept on giving him offerings. And they told him, do what you will. Send your birds, send your hogs, send anyone. We will just have to work harder. That's all. And so that's what they did. But every day, at the end of the day, they would make an offering. And at the beginning of the day, they would also make an offering of whatever they had. We have some millet. Please share it with us. We have some daikon today. I hope you like it. And so that's what they would share every day. A year passed and another year. And soon things started to change. When they planted seeds, oh, Hiroshi and Yukie saw that they, their plants grew. They sprouted. They had a wonderful harvest. And soon they had so much that they couldn't keep it in their house. And they went to their neighbors and said, please, we have abundant harvest. Can we share it with you? Would your children eat some? And so they kept sharing. And they thought, oh, that's wonderful. But the next year, their neighbors brought more back. And they said, you know, you gave us so much food that our children were healthy. And our old uh, family members were also healthy. And everybody worked. And our harvest is wonderful. So here's it back to you. And soon there was no space in their house. And they thought, oh, no. I think we need a storage space, a storage room. And the elders in the village said, no, 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 not only a storage space. Look at your house, so broken down. I think you need a new house too. We will help you build a new house and a storage room. And so that's what they did. The whole village got together and helped Hiroshi and Yukie build a new house and a new storage space. And soon the day came when they were supposed to move to their new home. Quickly, Hiroshi, before they moved, went to the family altar and called out, Oh, God of poverty, we are moving house today. We'd like you to do the, uh, do the honors and enter first. And they waited and waited. And out from a corner waddled a very prosperous looking, very plump and red looking little mouse. And Yoroshi said, Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, you are the god of happiness. No, 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 wrong god. We're looking for the god of poverty. God of poverty, where are you? Ah, uh, the god of happiness laughed. And he said, ah, oh, yes, yes. I'm not surprised you have difficulty recognizing me. Ah, uh, you know, with all the good food that you've given me, this is what I look like now. I tried making your life miserable but you just kept working and working and trying to make things work. And soon I found myself sending back the birds, sending back the caterpillars, sending everyone back and telling them, stay away, this is not your place. 
And every morning and every night, you'd give me such good food. Well, look at me now. I am now the God of happiness. And I would love to move to your new house with you. And I would love for you to continue taking care of me. And with that, climbed into Hiroshi's hand. And then Hiroshi put him down on the ground. He ran to the, end of the, the entrance of the house, looked back, smiled at everyone, and quickly ran into the new house to find his new space. And disappeared, never to be seen again. But it is said that those who are living in that house, even today, are brimming with happiness. The end. Thank you. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, very nice. What a marvelous idea um, to welcome the God of poverty into your house. Just such an extraordinary, nice. extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, yeah. what, a, what an idea to, to do that instead of um, shunning that and, and, and wanting to send it away, but to embrace that and say, we'll just work harder and look after you. It's just, wow. Wow. Extraordinary. I thought it was a nice one. Yeah. Yeah, really. Thank and you. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice, very nice, um, and 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 again, you, I think you 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 captured the the, the husband and wife uh, beautifully in, in the way that you characterise those those two uh, very generous people. Thank you, Charlie. That's that's lovely. Uh, now I'm I'm really excited because I think I actually see a, another man in the room. Tapan. <laughs> Yay! Hi, hi. And I gather you're in uh, Bangalore, is that correct? Pardon? Uh, you're in Bangalore, is that correct? Yes. I'm from Bangalore, India. Ah, very I good. I hope you're excited that Feast is coming to your home city. Yeah, yeah. And it is being organized here by my very dear friends. Very good. Very closely. Uh -huh. The Every Killing Society is uh, running for past about six years. Yep. The first Sunday of uh, every month, we get together and tell um, uh, stories, uh -huh. tell stories. And the last Sunday of every month, there are stories for children. Yeah. So events are organized by Bangalore Storytelling Society all the year round. Wow. And a regular teller there for last about thirty odd months. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been association with storytelling. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, that's impressive to have something here. You know, to me, every uh, the first Sunday of the month, and and the second another month when you another Sunday when you do the storytelling for kids. That's really good, very good. It happens. It has happened regularly without any fail. So. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So uh, I'm intrigued by the story that you have for us. Uh, it seems to be another uh, ecological theme. So um, please, why don't you share with us your story, Taban? You are all at different places in the world. But uh, it's not very costly to take a flight of imagination. And with that flight of imagination, I request you to fly over to a place called Sumatra. Sumatra is in Indonesia, which is little south of Singapore, because it is better identified like that. And the airport there is Kulanamu. And in that Kulanamu airport, if you drop down, there will be several friendly taxi drivers who can take you about two and a half hours drive into a place called Bukit Lawang. And from there, of course, early in the morning, next day, you please take a trek. And when you trek, 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 and go deep into the jungles, those rainforests that are still there in Sumatra, far above, if you look up, you may find an orange fluffy ball just lying there. And if you watch closely, you will find that Butam is sleeping there, pretty depressed that day, pretty down, on the hammock that he himself has tied up. From the branches of two trees, twisting them together, the skill that he had learned from his mother, and thinking about his mother, he gets a little sentimental, because he was there with the mother for about nine years of his life. And at 18, when he is pretty alone, not that he minds it, but today, it's a different day. He is lying on his side on a pillow that he has himself made from the leaves and thinking and tapping on a very ripe, round, melon looking fruit. You don't know what is the fruit about from this height, but you realize it is a plum, it's a very slushy fruit that you'd love to eat. 
but why an orangutan is not eating a fruit and just tapping on it you wonder he is not in the mood to eat a fruit today he is pretty sad and he is not jumping around he is not swinging he is not finding the fruits the leaves the roots that he normally eats and is also <clears throat> not trying to put that uh, pipe that he has made out of a leaf long leaf inside the hole of a tree and check whether there are eggs left by some small birds yeah he is equally proficient with his hands and feet and he can put it inside and scoop up one egg or two occasionally you may say call it stealing but that's how he is he puts his fingers around his cheek and again sighs <coughs> why he doesn't have that flange that orangutans normally have when they grow up he didn't that fluffy thing around his face never grew and that is the reason those beautiful orangutan ladies will never give him a second look and he doesn't know how to get a mate even at 18 he has to chase girls he has to kind of forcefully <clears throat> that is not him he wants somebody who will fall for him who will love him for whatever it is and to tell you the truth that happened yesterday he saw from the opposite tree tequila and she was just swinging and sort of dancing and when he was she was dancing you can see some sense of ballet in that of course she has never watched any ballet neither have i but seemed to the butam's intoxicated brain at that time that it was the best dance in the world and he was so enchanted and he wanted to dance with her to woo her to get to her but then at the flash of an eye she ran away and when she ran away from that 20 meter height that she was in she immediately dropped down to the road and took a human road just imagine a human road to run which orangutan runs they can swing but she ran and pute um in all his mind he covered and tried to follow her but she disappeared so pute thinks today what to do next how to find this girl and in that desperation he again turns aside and says today perhaps is his lucky day when he sees that sliver of orange again in front of him and that lady tequila is again swinging he gets very impressed and excited millions of neurons in his body send flash electric to his brain and his dull limp muscles suddenly come to life and the fruit that he was so long avoiding he picks it up eats half of it and throws the half to tequila tequila doesn't take it she just swings away now bitan is all excited he follows tequila he follows her he matches her step by step swing by swing and follows her till one point of time that is the end of the jungle and he finds trees which are tall with no branches to hold they all look same they are the palm trees from which we get palm oil and the palm oil that we all which makes our chips crispier makes our soaps soapier and we all need those palm oils perhaps much more than anyone has needed them ever plutam doesn't know all that an orangutan do 97% common dna with us need not know all these human tricks he is after one pursuit the pursuit of the basic instinct but palm trees are not his cup of tea or cup of tree you may say he cannot hold them he cannot swing on the palm trees so he does what he can do he basically very grudgingly walks through the palm trees till at one point of time he hears something crashing down <clears throat> something falls then <clears throat> something else falls he goes a little more and finds monster yellow machines everywhere big machines with their big teeth uprooting one tree after the other and then he hears the sound of distress that long call that orangutans give when they are in trouble ooh, 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 ooh. 
he looked up. He looked up a tree, a solitary tree that was left there, and whom he sees, he could recognize a familiar face, though at 30 meter high, he recognized that's his mother. And his mother at that time is pregnant again with his with a third child, Bhutan being the first born. With the third child, that lady is stuck there, doesn't know how to get down with yellow machines everywhere. Bhutan does what you may think is fictional. He gives out a war cry. He calls for other orangutans. He calls, ooh, ooh. He calls, and from one orangutan to the other, and the third, and the fourth, and the way 3,000 orangutans in that community, they all come rushing to that place. And there were how many humans? Of 10 of them. They attack those drivers of that of the bulldozers that were running there, of the JCBs that were running there, and Bhutan climbs up the tree, gets that lady down, and they walk together with the lady, pregnant lady, that lady orangutan back to the forest. You wish this was real. You wish this was not a story. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and particularly your uh, impersonations of the uh, orangutan. Have you actually been to Sumatra or you've been to a, a kind of one of these uh, kind of, what would you call it, a rehabilitation or a rescue center for the, the orangutans? No, unfortunately not. I saw a lot of videos on that mm. and I was touched by the way things are happening to sure. one of the most intelligent living beings on this planet. Yeah. And it seems there is no records. In the last two decades, about 45% of population of orangutans have come down. And the greed for palm oil is continuously increasing. So yeah. I crafted this story and told around. Mm. And it's yeah, it's a, it's a, a lovely story and it, it, uh, a good one to share. And I, uh, I, li I like the way that the, um, how the orangutan discovers, you know, comes to the end of the, the forest. I think that's a very real, um, certainly if uh, we are considering one possibility would be to go to Sarawak for next year's uh, conference. That's a possibility. And um, if we do that, if we're in uh, uh, Kuching, uh, then it would be very easy for you to get to one of the uh, orangutan, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, centers yeah. where they uh, um, look after them and, uh, you know, um, rehabilitate them, I guess is what I'm trying to say, into the forest wherever that's possible. I feel that environmental things are such that policies, I'm into sustainable buildings. I am yeah. basically, I do real estate development as profession and I do sustainable buildings, which are energy saving buildings and all. Nevertheless, I feel that uh, laws, policies, everything aside, the human beings tell each other the stories of disaster that are happening around. Perhaps somewhere some sense will prevail. Yeah, we hope. We hope. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, this is a, a true uh, scientific-based um, uh, story, if you like. Uh, and it's about, I, I start by showing pictures uh, taken stills from martial arts movies like uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, that kind of thing. Uh, and in a lot of those movies, they have these wonderful fights in bamboo forests and they go flying through there. Uh, of course, it's all done on wires, which you don't see in the movie. Um, and then I disappoint the kids by saying, no, I'm not here to talk about the martial arts movies, uh, but to talk about the bamboo. And the bamboo is a particular kind of bamboo called a moso, M-O-S-O. And the extraordinary thing about this uh, bamboo is if I was to give you a seed now, okay, and you were to take that, if I could transport that to you, you know, virtually, um, and you could take that seed and plant it because that is the theme of tonight, right? Um, and you planted it uh, outside your house or in one of um, uh, Tapan's uh, new uh, ecologically sound buildings that he's just designed. Um, and you plant your moso seed, okay, and you water it, and you wait a week, uh, there's nothing, a month, nothing, uh, six months, there's still nothing. And you're thinking, what kind of is this guy Jenkins that he gives me a seed and, and nothing happens, right? Uh, a year later, you've now forgotten completely where you actually planted this seed and you've forgotten all about it. Two years, three years, four years, five years, still nothing. 
But one night you come back from the office, wherever it is that you are working, okay, uh, the school where you've been running uh, yet another of your workshops, perhaps, okay, or, or uh, Mindy, who's uh, sat there and, and thinking about how she's going to use this in a lesson. And when you get back to your house, right there, where you planted the mosso, there it is. And it's 60 centimeters tall. It's up to your knees. Yesterday, it wasn't there. But today, it's up to your knees. The next day, you go off to school, to work, you come home, and now it's up here, up to your chest, another 60 centimeters. The third day, you go off to work, wherever, you come home, and now it's up here, up to your head. And it keeps on growing like that, 60 centimeters every single day. That's, what's, that's more than what, two and a half centimeters an hour. You could almost sit there and watch it grow, right? And for the next six to seven weeks, it keeps doing this astonishing growth until it reaches a height of 35 to 40 meters, okay? And I asked the kids, well, what happens? How did that do? For five years, you see absolutely nothing. And it's a bit like feast, isn't it, Sheila? Here we are, we're going to work for five years, and maybe we will see nothing. But we hope at the end of the fifth year, suddenly, we'll have a forest of storytellers, okay? Uh, I love telling the stories within, um, like, community groups, because it's about planting these seeds, and you, you know, you wonder, are we doing any good? Is there any point to what we're doing? For a kid, you go into primary one, yeah, and you're going to leave five years or six years later. And I show a picture of a, a you know, a kid uh, who's like six or seven years old, and he's this big. And I then have a picture of one of the New York G Giants, I think they're called, it's a baseball team, and it's a guy on stilts, you know, so he's like, you know, 12 feet tall. And I say, if I came back in five years' time, would I see you like this? Um, and I say, I'm not talking about what's going on physically, it's about what's going on in here and, and in here. Because what that most OC does for five years is to put down roots, yeah? And whether those roots are our friendships, the values that we uh, acquire, that we develop, we need them. So that at the end of five years, that tree yeah, is gonna be able to have the roots to drive it up, okay? Uh, and of course, to have the breadth, because if you've got, uh, you know, that wonderful Chinese actress, uh, what's her name, Zhang Ziyi, going pow with her foot, if you haven't got good strong roots, you're just gonna fall over, right? So the idea of, yeah, what are you gonna do for the next five years? How are you going to make your roots, okay? Grow wide, grow deep, your community, your friendship, be like the mozo, and so we suddenly will see that spectacular. Google it, you'll find it. it's completely true. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, everybody for sharing the stories. I think it's just great how we get this kind of uh, diversity uh, of tales and tellers. Thank you very much, Sridevi, that's really good. Um, and just the different ways that people tell. And again, we've had some wonderful serendipitous kind of um, links between the stories um, that we didn't expect. Okay. Uh, how about you, Sridevi? Which, which, which story do you think um, you want to go and share? I, what I liked a couple. I liked yours. That was a uh -huh. lovely story. I also did like um, a hope story. That yeah. was wonderful as well. Yeah. Charlotte's um, God of Poverty. So I think that my next story will probably be what Hope narrated. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, it's been a really enjoyable session. Um, and do, again, if you go on to the, the uh, website, uh, you will see that we've already started um, putting links to stories told by our members. It will be wonderful to have, um, you know, by all means, send us uh, your link. And it doesn't have to be uh, telling in English. Uh, uh, should I do you tell in, um, uh, what's your mother tongue? Tamil. Oh, it's mm -hmm. Tamil. Okay, so by all means, tell us, uh, have a story in, in Tamil. Tamil. Or do, or I'm do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> tell us two, send us two versions, the English version and, and the Tamil oh, version. It's really okay. important, okay? Uh, or again, from in, in Bangalore, it's, what is the? Canada. Canada, okay, yeah. So, you know, we, we really want Feast, uh, of, while we conduct uh, our business in English, that doesn't mean that we just have to be a repository of stories told in English. And I think the more that we can uh, feature stories, have 
that, that as a resource, then I think that uh, institutions, organizations around the world are going to find FEAST uh, you know, a very worthwhile organization to support and belong to.